the Chevy Music Showcase. It's 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 the Chevy Music Showcase Season 1 Special, an insider view of the North Texas music scene, featuring the talents of the Hannah Barbarians, Blacktop Gypsy, Hairs on the Mountain, The O's, Tejas Brothers, Quaker City Nighthawks, D. Anson Brody, Seren, Holy Moly, Madison King, 1100 Springs, and the FNAs. Presented commercial free by the North Texas Chevy Dealers. For the past year, the North Texas Chevy Dealers have showcased a wide range of creators and performers of original music. And one thing our show has demonstrated beyond the shadow of a doubt is that our local music community is as diverse, original, and bursting with talent as any of the so-called music capitals. Still, that doesn't make it any easier for them to compete against the national acts. That's why the Chevy Music Showcase endeavors to shine a light on something we consider a real point of pride and share some insights on what makes these troubadours tick. What put them on this path? What are their challenges? What keeps them going? How do they turn a nugget of an idea into a connection among complete strangers? Well, to find out, come hang with the band and get to know a few gems of the North Texas music scene. For me, I actually remember the time I realized I want to be on stage and play rock and roll music. And I was about 12 years old, and the Who documentary was on. This 11-minute long narrative rock opera with like five different styles of music. And it was insane. I mean, there's Roger Daltrey swinging the microphone, and John Entwistle singing falsetto, and Townsend is doing windmills, and they just like, and it's just devastating. And at the end, they say, you're all forgiven. And I was like, yes, I am. That's put, I mean, that's, that's perfect because this is what I've been looking for for my miserable 12 years in nowhere, Texas. This is it. This is what I want to do. We both come from musical families. My stepdad actually played every instrument that he had in the house, and, and I never learned how to play any of them. But my mom uh, yes, sang and, and played um, bass fiddle. Bass fiddle or doghouse bass. Or okay. We call okay. It. That's what I started on, I was upright. I think sometime in middle school, my, my folks got fed up with just you know video games all day long, so they came upstairs and they said, uh, karate or guitar? <laughs> <laughs> if only you had chosen karate. I know, I know. <laughs> played in Fort Worth when he was younger and played in cover bands for years and he still does to this day but uh, when I was a little kid I asked for a guitar and my hands were too small because I was eight years old I couldn't make chords I got really frustrated and I was like this is stupid <laughs> so I gave it up I was like I'm gonna be a baseball player <laughs> so I was, and then when I got to be about 11 or 12 my dad got me Led Zeppelin 4 and I was like whatever those drums are doing I want to do that and he was like okay but you're gonna have to practice and show me that you actually care about it before I bring the drums home. So I just listened to all these songs and made a drum kit out of boxes and stuff. And he came in my room and watched me play on my box drum set and he's like, holy crap, they're like, you can actually do this. I bet it was more like, damn it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah probably. What made you decide to be a my guitar teachers, player? My teachers so, in school, you know. Really? I wanted to be in orchestra class because in fourth grade, we got out of math class early <laughs> in order to do it. And that was purely my motivation, <laughs> to get into playing music. And the orchestra teacher assigned me a violin, and uh, I brought it home. My dad said, mm -mm, no. With the most dead serious face I think I can remember from him. He said, he said no, you are not playing that squeaky Why? thing around oh, here. He said, why don't you play the, the cello or the bass or something? He said, yeah. Something boom, that boom, makes boom, a boom. note yeah. when you actually hit it? So I said, I don't care. I just want to get a math class. So that's why that, then you started and on bass? those teachers were the ones that I remember their names. They made such an impact on my life that I chose to work at it more. They were the ones that cared a little extra bit. Right. The desire to make music may come from inside, but the kind of music one makes almost always comes from someone who came before. Me personally, I was born with a Hank Williams record in my hands. It's always 
always been country, that's it. But I mean, my folks listen to a wide range of music. It's the sort of thing that you don't even realize how wide the range was until you get a little older and you're like discovering things for yourself and you start digging through their record collection. You're like, I didn't know my dad was into Cannonball Latterly and Ornette Coleman and things like that. But there it is, right there. And I go and listen to their 45s, get into the coasters, get into the Eddie Cochran, get into Gene Vincent. It's all there. And any, there was never a time where I couldn't go, hey, I'm into this sort of music. And my mom would go, okay, uh, you should be listening to this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. I'm like, what? why haven't you told me about this stuff before? <laughs> where, you didn't where, ask. where does this come from, you know? I was busy listening to the exploited, you know? So. <laughs> My biggest influence, without a doubt, is Nino Saliva. He's, uh, they call him the dancing cowboy. He's been playing for over 40 years, man, probably closer to 50 now. With all due respect wow. to everyone else, he's the best. I would have thought you would have said Flaco Jimenez. Yeah. I've heard him. Damn His music, oh, he's very, yeah. very influential. I mean, he was a part of the Texas Tornadoes, which is a huge influence on the Te Tejas Brothers. What about you? What I, I'm, I came from a really hardcore like blues background. Of course, we got all the Texas blues icons, so I mean, it just it kind yeah. of falls in place. And then, and then my father used to listen to, uh, you know, Buck Owens and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis. My dad too, man. Yeah. My parents listened to horrible music. I was on my own. <laughs> my dad would like it'd be Friday night at midnight, and like nine years old, and the walls would start rattling as I'm going to sleep. He's got his speakers cranked up. It's pitch black in there, and I can just see him like. Illuminated with the glow of the stereo. <laughs> Dad, what are you doing? He's like, come here, boy. It's free education. Here's some, here's Dylan. This is the Stones. This is Hendrix. As far as I'm concerned, when I was in sixth grade, somebody gave me a tape with the Pixies on it, and on the other side was the Smiths. And I think all the way through high school, I think that's I exclusively listened to Pixies and Frank Black. And then um, for some reason, I bought a banjo. I don't really know what I was thinking. What were we thinking that night? We wanted to start a band. Oh yeah. <laughs> we were so smart then. I know, I know, I know. A lot has happened since then, John. Yeah. The artists of the Chevy Music Showcase cover a broad range of sounds and styles. But there's at least one trait they all share. They all perform original music. That comes with its own set of challenges, not the least of which is actually writing it. I write pretty much constantly, and not officially constantly, but there's no part of the day that it's not a possibility that there'll be something come up. You live to write, write to live? I mean. No, I don't. It's compulsive. <laughs> I would much rather do more constructive things like exercise, you know, talk to loved ones, and things like that, but I can't help it. I have a, I have a problem with it. I almost like work on deadlines. Like basically I'm like, oh, I gotta go write songs, and it helps me, it gets my brain spinning faster. I almost always start with the guitar, That's, almost we always. We really mostly do, too. Yeah. And, and then I'll get a certain emotion that matches a certain part that I've been playing for two, three years and I've never written a song to, and then it'll all come out. And the guitar parts will already be there, and maybe I'll add a part here or there, but in general, that's how it works for me. A lot of our songs will start with a, with a text message. When someone you know runs across something that amuses or, or sparks it, and then oh well, yeah, the there's there's good then, there's a good quite a few songs that I get from from him on a about three in the morning, you know, random. Yeah. And then we show up next week and great. it's a song. There's a song in that, you know. A lot of my songs start with a play on words that I find amusing. And then I sort of try to build a story around that's it. That's country music right there. It's yeah, totally. It is totally country music. And um, I feel like that's pretty much how I write every song. It's like I get like that one hook or that one line that I really like, and then I just kind of have to figure out everything else. How it always goes for me is it's like, all right, I've had this, you know, one chorus for about six months, and then I force myself to sit down and write the whole song in one day. The idea of our band is everybody, there's no one songwriter, there's no one person that's like the most influential, it's, it's just like six guys that like to play music and kind of go with whatever's brought to the table. Whatever, and it's, it's, it's really hard but yet really 
fun and interesting and rewarding when we can pull it off. I have a, a saying that I go by. If a song doesn't do one of these three things, then why write it? Why perform it? It's got to either make you laugh, it's got to either make you cry, or it's got to make you move. It's all about the song. If you don't have a song, nobody cares about the guitar ride for country music. They don't care about the, I mean, it can really add a lot to it. And if you, you know, there's some beautiful parts that you can put into a country song, but it's all about the lyrics and whether or not the singer's singing it the way that makes you believe it. And uh, get rid of all the nonsense and let's get to the truth. For me, I've noticed that life has been a little bit more of an influence as far as for me from music, you know, it's, um, it's your opportunity to tell a story, you know, and every song that you write and every song that you do, it's an opportunity to tell a story. The work doesn't stop when the song is written. The true test of a songwriter's metal comes when their masterpiece is set free to see how it is received by fans and peers. Fortunately for our artists, the North Texas music scene provides fertile ground for their work to take root. We don't necessarily wait for the audience to quiet down. Yeah. What Eric's sort of thing is, he's like, you guys are hanging out and we're hanging out, so let's get together and just have fun. Yeah. And so we're almost aggressively a good time sometimes. <laughs> What's the end goal for you guys when doing live shows? I think that the main thing is just how much energy is in the crowd and people are going nuts. We want to break through the ceiling, you know, we want to get as crazy, as, as wild as you can get. When you have the interaction with an audience as well as with your band members. I think that's, it could be, um, it could be magical sometimes. <laughs> yeah. we, had a, we had a show the other night where um, these bikers started kind of following us to where we play, which I know seems not for our music, you know, we're a little country, but um, we were playing the other night, actually at Port Evans Pub. And I looked out and um, one of these bikers started getting teary out at one of the songs that we played. And to me that was, um, that was monumental, probably one of the, uh, if, if, you can, if you can make a biker get teary-eyed, and let me tell you, he looks tough. You know, I thought that was pretty cool. So when you get up in the morning, and you know that you got a gig that night, what's the, what's the main motivation for you to get out there and do it? To make people smile, and I'll tell you why. Not just smile like, ah, oh, but our band is so diverse that we like to go and provide kind of like a party atmosphere and we have all the most popular races in our band. <laughs> if, what we like to see is the diverse crowd that we get. Yeah. And it, it, we've seen it bring people together and having a good time, man. From 9 to 99, that's yeah. what it yep. runs. Yep. Everybody come gather around. Hear the music is going down. Do what you do, cause you know you found. Here at the gonna shout, hey! I definitely think there's something to be said about being a musician in our area in Dallas, yeah, Fort Worth. Especially right now. It's a super prideful scene, I think, um, as far as what we're putting out there. There's a lot of talent around, too. We have a lot of talent in the Metroplex, for sure. I'm just consistently blown away by the great artists, the great songwriters, the great musicians that are just playing everywhere. And by going out to a local music show, you have you know a chance to, one, make a connection with an artist that, that you can actually have a connection with, rather than someone you're seeing from the 800th row you know, miles away. And, and to support someone who's, who's trying to do something and you may not like you know the first show you go to or the second show you go to but you know if you go out and, and check out local bands you're gonna find something someone's doing something in your town that you're gonna be a fan of and enjoy and it's just it's it's very rewarding you know even before I was playing in the local music scene I was going out and and finding that stuff and still some of my favorite CDs to this day are from local artists of course one can only enjoy home field advantage for so long at some point you got to take the show on the road. One of the hardest things is, is when you do venture out of your, your area that your, your name has kind of been branded a little bit more. When you get out of that area, the toughest thing is just getting people to show up. It's a hard thing to do to take it on the road and actually come home with money in your pocket. Usually you leave and after you pay for gas and you pay for hotels and then you play a show in a town you never played for and you know you hope to sell two CDs, you know, getting going. It's it's hard to actually, you know, make it where it's it's a self-funding endeavor. The point is, is that you would literally put up put up with anything <laughs> to get to do what we get to do, I guess. You know what yeah. I mean? We started the two piece band because it's almost you know, it's like we want to be on a band that goes on the road, you know, and then you have a full band, it's just harder. You know, you got more mouths to feed, this and that. For the two of us, I mean, we can hop on a plane and be anywhere. We have a lot of good reactions in Fort Worth, for sure. 
Outside of Fort Worth, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. We've had some funny shows at restaurants. We don't go over real well at restaurants. <laughs> but um, it's too loud, I think, for a patio gig. Triple guitar and appetizers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we played a gig in Abilene, for, we got paid. They're like, we don't have any money for you, but we're going to throw out this broccoli and cheese soup if you want some of it. So they gave us two huge <laughs> And of course, Starbucks. initially, we're, like, we're not going to take it. We don't it. want the soup. Yeah, we'll take the soup. <laughs> okay, we'll have that soup. And then we're in the parking lot, and then we're on the we'll top of the car, the and we're kind of, you know, consulting one another as to, we got paid Try not soup, to cry that <laughs> This is real. Like, you know, this is the, the soup. We literally you know, got paid We should have stayed in school, and then as we're doing this, <laughs> one of the things of cheese soup falls and explodes in the parking lot. I think the coolest thing is when you do get an audience that's never seen you before and they're all of a sudden, you know, you do one thing, you get lucky and play the right song first and everyone's like, oh yeah, oh, this is cool, and stop talking to their friends. And then everyone's listening and you just, like, the next song and the next song, you know what's coming and you know that they don't. So every time, you know, we have a lot of that, like, crashing in on the drums or, like, things are about to space out. You know, the audience has no idea what's coming up and that's, that's one of my favorite moments. And that's a big reason to tour. There is a certain amount of tightness and a certain amount of just really good playing that only comes when you are eating every single meal, day after day, week after week with these guys. You're driving each other nuts, you smell. But Truck when you get up on stage, week. even if it's just some little hole in the wall that barely even has the sound system, and you are rank and tired and exhausted, and you put on your guitar and you're like, okay, I'm home, I got nothing else to do. A life in music may seem like all fun, but outside of the time you see them on stage is when the real work happens. Just like in any small business, they have to do it all. If you want to play music locally, the first step, 100% always, is get a job. And then go play some shows. Whenever somebody is introduced to somebody else, I don't know what anybody does for a living. You're always introduced as what band you're in. Yeah, yeah. Always. I have no idea what anyone does for a living. They could live in a box. I have no clue. Several of them probably do. So do you know you're in this for the money? No. <laughs> it's all about money. the Benjamins, right? Benjamins? You get Benjamins? <laughs> no. I get we Lincoln. get Abraham Lincoln. I get Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of weird too when you discover, he's just like almost like a superhero kind of life. And like you never know the secret identity. The barbarians, we're, we're pretty much all like, service industry guys. We all bartend and wait tables and stuff like that. What about you guys? Any secret identities? Um, I work at a library. I work at a diner. I'm a, I'm a college professor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I teach art history and art appreciation. There you go. I studied medieval manuscripts. <laughs> Nerd. I can't come home. I won't come home and sleep with It's obviously our, our passion and it's obviously what we want to do, but it's still a job. Mm -hmm. like it's still, oh, yeah. you gotta work really hard and you gotta just keep at it, you know? I would love for, you know, just, just being a songwriter or an artist to be a feasible thing to check on your career plan and just start receiving checks in the mail, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is there's, outside of writing the songs and learning your instrument and practicing as a band, there's a business side as well that you, you have to pay some sort of attention to if you ever want to have it, have it be a feasible occupation to spend part of your time in. And you know, whether that's learning the ins and outs of music licensing, which is super complicated. Um, and super important if you're yeah. talking about being able to sustain your life without exactly. having to have a day job, you know? Yeah, and you know, there's, there's a bunch of aspects to it. Um, but even, even you know, simple things along the lines of you know, getting your CDs printed and then selling them and figuring out how to sell them online and you know, just you know, looking at every aspect of how music could be some sort of income to you. I would love to just work on the f and full time. I mean, that is like a dream of mine. What, what you guys are doing right now is like a... It's a leap of faith. Yeah, it really is. Because um, when we first started this band, by no means did we have the financial success at that time for us to just quit our day jobs and just do it full time. So it was a sacrifice, and we said, we gotta 
You know, I did it. I was the first one to take a leap in the band, and I, everything in my whole life was Tejas Brothers. That's it. So where is all of this heading? Well, you may be surprised to learn that not all of them are gunning for the cover of the Rolling Stone. The dreams are as diverse as the artists themselves. I got 400 CDs sitting above my hot water cooler. I might right. as well give them to somebody, you know? I gotta move them. <laughs> so, yeah, I give one to anybody who wants one, for sure. I mean, you need the money, but at the same time, like, you understand that this level, like at a local level, all we're trying to do is get to the next level. You know, and like, you don't really have an opportunity to ask for money for your product until you're at like level 10. Right. And we're at like level three, so you kind of got to like do whatever you can to kind of get up those rungs. There's a trade off. It could go anywhere. You never know how much, you know, big you're going to catch on. Like, the idea for, for me mostly is that we can make something that we really like personally. Like some music that we can get behind and we can be like, this is us, this is what we put out. And then from there it's just strategy, it's getting it into the different people's ears. And if it catches on, then that's great, you know? And like whatever becomes of that, you know, we'll ride that. But at the base of it, even no one listens, we want to at least like it ourselves, yeah. you know? Because somewhere in there there's magic and that's what we want to put out. You know, do we all want to be successful? I mean, what? how do you measure success? I mean, there's a million questions that kind of, um, uh, to me, uh, I'm already successful. I'm, right. I'm doing what I know that I'm supposed to do, uh, whether anybody else knows that or not. How could you ever make his blue eyes cry? Kiss his sweet lips, lie after lie, you always ever know what you had. Thank you, Tracy. mission statements in our band. Before every show we get up and we put it in and we all say the same thing, the FNAs are a successful band, make a lot of money, tour the world. Well, there's because another part what, after that we can't say. Yeah, we can't say it on camera, there's another <laughs> part after that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're here to make, a, you know, oh, we're actually here to make millions, but yeah. yeah. Come on, yeah. I was like, have we not been going about it? Do we not have the same game plan here, dude? Yeah. <laughs> We sort of build walls around us because we have a lot at stake. We have a lot to protect. You know, we've dedicated our lives to this stuff. Uh, but at the same time, music is a, it's communication, it's entertainment. And so it is finding a balance, though, between this sort of pridefulness in what you do and this sort of these kinds of challenges you put in front of yourself as a band that you're sort of proud that you've overcome and you've constructed these puzzles or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. And at the same time, appeal to people, you know, and that's. That's a difficult thing to do. Mountainous creative challenges, limited respect, long trips with lousy accommodations, endless hours of hard work and little or no money. With a job description like that, you gotta wonder, what keeps them going? Well, it's like, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the business aspect of things, but, you know, there's a reason we spend the time doing the business aspect of things is because this is something we just have to do. Um, you know, I know, if, if I haven't played a show in a while, uh, I, I'm just not a good person to be around. I get grouchy, I don't wanna, you know, and you know, my wife will tell me, hey, you should go book a show or go like to a jam night or just go do that because <laughs> I don't wanna hang out with you until you do. As a musician, every time you sit down and play your instrument, it's for a different reason and it has a different use to you. You're trying to say something and music is the best way to communicate it. And I feel like when you're listening to music, each person is listening to that song for a different reason and gets something different from that song. When I'm naughty, I'll be sitting on that stage, oh, you won't. drinking whiskey, playing old guitars. If yeah, you let me. Not that stage. You'll be kicked out of your band. Yeah, wave. I, it, it, but if I got to do it on the curb, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, it, honestly, it's something that I will compulsively do this for the rest of my life. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had just experiences, just human experiences with fans, you know, and it's, there's no disconnect, uh, at least for me, that these, I don't, I don't see fans as people that are funding my life, they're people to me, they're, they're, they're my kinship, friends, kind of friendship. They're, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a certain yeah. level of friendship that happens, even if it's for a moment in time, that recognition of each other's, you know, humanity is, is, is awesome yeah, to me. I just want to play. Yeah. I just I, I started out because I wanted to play, and I just want to keep playing. 
and I'm going to keep playing until I can't anymore. And if that's for a thousand people who are loving it, that's fantastic. But if that's for two people who are eating appetizers while I'm giving them the triple guitar attack, then I'm going to do that too. You know, and people get kind of dark sometimes on aging stars, still making the rounds. You know, but I look at that and I think, sign me up. You know, no one's ever going to tell me to stop. Local music defines and enriches a community, and it only thrives with your support. So treat yourself to a night out sometime soon, and cheer on a local musician. They've earned it. You kiss me on a Friday night, walking to your Chevy on July Alley. You held my hand inside that truck. I felt you'd never let me go. And nothing ever felt so right as that first hot Dallas summer night. Oh, my body knew that it was young, and my head knew that we had time. Chevy on July Alley. 